Hey, what's up, Kim peeps? Who is ready for another fantastic chemistry video? What in the heck are we gonna do? Ultimate goal here, predict whether or not a physical or chemical process is thermodynamically favored by determination, either quantitatively or qualitatively, of the signs of both delta H and delta S in calculation or estimation of delta G when needed. Again, a lot there, but now that we've talked a little bit about some of these variables individually, we're gonna put them together to predict the thermodynamic favorability of a reaction. All right, so the relationship between delta H, delta S, and delta G is provided in the equation that is on your screen, in your notes, and on your formula chart. The delta G of the reaction is equal to the delta H minus T delta S. Now, if you understand basic algebra, this table probably makes a lot of sense. Basically, as we try to determine whether or not a reaction is thermodynamically favorable or thermodynamically unfavorable, we need to know the enthalpy change, the temperature, and the entropy change for the reaction. And depending on whether those signs are negative or positive, and at what relative temperature, you can determine whether or not that reaction is thermodynamically favored or not. But under the time pressure of the test, it might be a little challenging. Your algebra skills might start to fail you. So here's a thriller of a way that I like to remember the relationship between delta S and delta H and what that tells me about the thermodynamic favorability of a reaction. Generally, when I get to these questions, I say to myself, oh, sh I can't do math under this limited amount of time. Let me just make myself a coordinate plane and oh, sh I put delta S on the Y axis, delta H on the X. Delta H is negative and delta S is positive, then delta G is always gonna be negative. Those are always thermodynamically favorable conditions. However, if delta H is positive and delta S is negative, delta G is always gonna be positive, no matter what temperature you're at. Again, go back to this equation and think about those two things. But then, and here's where the magic comes in, if delta S is positive and delta H is positive, one of those terms is thermodynamically favorable, one of them isn't, delta G will be spontaneous, but only at high temperatures. Again, come back to this equation. And the only way to get a spontaneous reaction is if you subtract, if this T delta S is larger than your delta H. That's only gonna happen when T is really high. But notice where it falls on the coordinate plane. It's up top. On the other hand, if delta H is negative, which is thermodynamically favorable, but delta S is negative, which is thermodynamically unfavorable, the reaction will be spontaneous, or delta G is gonna be negative, only at low temperatures. Again, come back to the equation, think about it. Math, all right, just a few quick things then to think about as you try to get the relationship between these three different things straight in your brain. Even if you determine a reaction to be thermodynamically favorable, it still might not occur at any measurable rate. In other words, something could be thermodynamically favorable but happen really slowly. If they have, for example, a very high activation energy. When this happens, we say the reaction is said to be under kinetic control, which is something we're gonna talk about when we get to our kinetics unit. But, for example, the formation of water from its elements is a very thermodynamically favorable reaction. But simply mixing hydrogen and oxygen together you have to spark it up. You have to add some activation energy. Second thing to keep in mind is that reactions that are not thermodynamically favorable can be forced to proceed by applying an external source of energy, such as electricity in electrolysis and battery charging, or the use of light and other electromagnetic radiation in photosynthesis, ionization processes, something you should already be familiar with as you think about our unit on electrochemistry. Third thing to think about, combining thermodynamically unfavored reactions with thermodynamically favored reactions via their common intermediates can lead to an overall thermodynamically favorable process. We call that coupling. Now, there's an example on your screen and in your notes where we have a non-spontaneous or thermodynamically unfavorable reaction and we couple it with a thermodynamically favorable or spontaneous reaction so that Overall, the combined reaction is thermodynamically favorable or spontaneous. Fourth thing to keep in mind as you think about the relationship between these three different things is to note that the values of zero kilojoules per mole, the enthalpy of formation and Gibbs free energy formation for the elements. That's just their value by definition. 
often this information is left out on the information provided in the enthalpy formation and Gibbs free energy formation values in a problem. Something that you need to lock away in your brain. But notice that for entropies of formation for the elements, those values are not zero for elements in their standard states. Common misconception. And the last thing to think about, usually the units of enthalpy change and Gibbs free energy change are in terms of kilojoules and units of entropy change are in terms of joules. So common error that is made when working through these types of problems is failing to ensure that your units are the same before working through that equation. One of the most important formulas when it comes to determine thermodynamic favorability of a reaction. You guessed it, here it is. Take a look at our first set of conditions. Before I jump to my calculator, let's again be cautious about units. Enthalpy change is in kilojoules. Entropy change is in joules. So keep that in mind as I jump to my calculator. Three thousand joules. Minus parentheses three hundred times one thirty. Close parentheses. Answer. Delta G equals positive one kilojoule. Unfavorable. Positive delta G tells me so. Next example. Forty thousand joules. Minus new parentheses three hundred times 150, close parentheses answer. Delta G equals negative five kilojoules. Favorable, a negative delta G tells me so. Again, 40,000 joules. Minus parentheses, negative 300 times 150, close parentheses answer. Delta G equals positive 85 kilojoules. Unfavorable, why? Positive delta G, again, negative 40,000 joules. Minus, new parentheses, negative 300 times 130. Close parentheses, answer. Delta G equals negative 1 kilojoule. Favorable, negative delta G tells me so. Uno mas, negative 40,000 joules. Minus, parentheses, 300 times 150. Close parentheses, answer. Delta G equals negative 85 kilojoules. Favorable. Negative delta G tells me so. Have a fantastic day.